We wanted to really kick it off with a taste of what the magazine is like. So we're gonna hear a quick reading from Gary over here, who was a contributor to the first issue. Um, and he's gonna read you a part of his contribution to the magazine. Woohoo! <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, so I'll be reading uh, excerpts from my piece called Depression and the Art That Saved Me. I was 14 when I first felt the urge to end my own life. Most mornings, I would wake up feeling cold and unwanted. Even in the spring, when the dogwood tree outside my window blossomed, I struggled to find beauty in the world to motivate myself to get out of bed. Although there were spurts of happiness, my teenage years were haunted by the desire to call it quits. I struggled with my emotions, but more importantly, I struggled with why. Why did I feel those urges? Why was I unhappy? For years, I tried answering. Uh, these questions and wondered if my parents' rocky marriage or my failed two-week middle school relationship factored into my depression. As I, re as I entered high school, however, I began to realize that these contortions of the mind were rooted in an internal struggle with my race and my identity. I grew up in a predominantly white community where I surrounded myself with white friends. I ignored our differences in race and fundamentally our differences in culture. I, and I sacrificed an important part of myself to blend in among my peers. I ate different foods at home than I did at school. I was annoyed when my parents mispronounced basic English words, yet I would shamelessly laugh when white students made mocking impersonations of other Asians. I wondered whether my true self was the person I was at home, the person I was at school, or neither. I remember a time when I was flipping through movie channels and lingered on a Jackie Chan film, a scene where he was distressed and exclaimed in a heavy accent, who am I, was branded in my mind for years. Who am I? A major challenge of my depression was desensitization. In order to cope with suicidal thoughts, I lar largely ignored them. I set my emotions aside and put on a plastic smile wherever I went. Over time, not only did I become an expert at hiding how I felt inside, but I also became incapable of letting my emotions flow. For years, I never cried despite how desperately I begged to. I lost the sensation of being human and felt completely out of touch with my emotions. One summer during high school, my dad dropped me off on the National Mall in Washington, DC. Go explore, he said, as he drove off to work. I loathed the experience. I wanted to spend my summer at home playing Call of Duty or aimlessly scrolling through Facebook. After a few days wandering through museums of natural history, airplanes, and design, I eventually stumbled into the Hirschhorn, a Smithsonian museum dedicated to modern and contemporary art. On view was an Eve Klein retrospective, highlighted by monochromes and blue impressions of the female body pulled across canvas. Searching for meaning in these paintings sparked a sense of curiosity and what I would later discover to be a sense of purpose. I devoted the remainder of my high school years to pursuing my fledgling interest in the arts to see how far I could take it. Fortunately, my parents supported this move because they thought it would make me a unique candidate when it came time for college applications. In fact, the focus shifted from making sure I had good grades in calculus and statistics to allowing me to curate my identity around the arts in order to stand out from the Asians who had perfect SAT scores. I enrolled in AP Art History and subsequently in independent study. But something was still missing. Academia bored me. I was never satisfied simply reading about it. Plus, for however much I loved art, studying art at a suburban high school where the jocks still ruled supreme was perceived as less than cool. I continued living as an outsider, not fully in the Asian community, and not fully in any other. Even as I pursued what I loved, I still felt alone. At Duke University, that sentiment persisted into my sophomore year. It was the only, I was the only male art history major and the only minority in my class. Even though I had found a group of like-minded individuals, I couldn't get over how different I was on the surface. Searching for an escape, I proceeded with the only millennial thing to do, and I created an Instagram. It became my diary. My Instagram, at ArtDrunk, began as a means to document artwork I liked, hated, and everything in between. Ultimately, I realized it was an outlet for communicating my emotions. What I posted in this digital world often reflected how I felt in real time and in real life. Posting a Lucio Fontana, an Italian artist known for slashing into canvases, reflected one of my troubled moments and my connection with the rawness of breaking an otherwise perfect surface. Posting a Richard Serra, an American sculptor known for massive expanses of steel, reflected how I enjoyed feeling human again under a towering wall of metal and knowing that it would exist 
centuries beyond my life. As my Instagram following grew, so did my sense of purpose. Although the challenges of being Asian American in a white community and the additional struggle of being a minority in the arts have made me feel different, I believe that my race does not define me. It is only a part of my identity rather than the whole of it. I continue to engage with my heritage, learning about different Asian teas, and being proud to hear Taiwan become the first Asian country to legalize gay marriage. But through art, I'm empowered to push beyond stereotypes. It has helped me create an identity for myself, not restricted by the color of my skin or the way my eyes squint when I smile. My battle with depression lasted seven years, which transformed the way I viewed the world and the people around me. Those seven years took me down a road where I thought the darkness would never turn to light. But eventually, those seven years brought me to my foremost passion. Through the struggle, I found art. And in a very real and literal sense, art saved me. Without it, I would still be lost trying to understand what it means to be different and what it means to be me. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was an awesome reading. And we're going to get to hear from Gary about that piece in a bit. Perfect. <laughs> All right. I'm excited to introduce our panel here today. Um, just going to do some quick bios so we have some context. Um, directly to my right <laughs> is uh, our two founders, Katerina and Christy. Katerina is a um, product strat strategist in the tech industry and has worked uh, from companies actually ranging from like Yahoo to early stage Silicon Valley startups. She's passionate about music. Um, about topics like making topics like race and identity easier to talk about in our everyday lives, and has a bachelor's of arts in English and music from Cornell. Christy is a creative strategist at Lander, a global brand consultancy, and uh, serves on the national advisory board of Answer, a sex education nonprofit that provides pro bono consulting services to women led organizations. Uh, she is an avid storyteller who hopes to one day perform at The Moth and holds a dual degree in business administration and public health from UC Berkeley. Um, Tessa is actually the creative, sorry, what was it, marketing director? Uh, head of digital. Head of digital, yeah. yes, sorry. <laughs> head of digital, the person who like knows what Instagram photos are coming up from this event, essentially. <laughs> we planned that out earlier. Um, she spent the last five years here at NYC putting her marketing degree to use. We actually talked at lunch about how she's the only one of us who actually uses her degree. <laughs> um, and uh, currently leads luxury marketing and uh, for the ad sales department at the Wall Street Journal, as well as heading up the digital efforts at Slanted. Um, also perfecting challah making skills, which yeah. is pretty awesome. I just married, yeah. married my Jewish husband, so yeah. I'm working, working on perfecting my challah. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I personally know that Asian Jewish pairing is a strong one. So, <laughs> <you know. laughs> um, and then Gary, who we just heard from, is a business analyst at, for the CIO at Pfizer mm -hmm. Lending Solutions and an aspiring art collector. As you heard from his piece, you can also follow him on Instagram at, at @artdrunk. Uh, so check that out afterwards as well. But I think I wanted to kick it off kind of by hearing, first of all, from our two founders here about sort of what you, how you would define like what Slanted is and what inspired you to found it. Yeah, I can sort of tell the origin story. So Slanted is a media company that celebrates Asian American identity through personal storytelling. And it came about because Christy invited me to a Facebook group called Project Boat, which was just a place for people to, Asian Americans, to post about what's going on in the news, ask for advice, and just have a community of like-minded people. And I saw all these amazing stories happening, but they were happening in this private Facebook group. And I was like, this needs to be out into the world. So I was like, hey, Chrissy, you want to start a zine? And we had like a humble spreadsheet where people were just dropping in ideas of what stories they might want to contribute. And then from there, we launched our Kickstarter campaign in June, which got such amazing support. Um, and that funded the issue one, which is on sale today. Um, and then for the launch party for issue one, we really felt just such an amazing sense of community. Like we had a sold out launch party. The energy and the support was just so incredible. And at that moment, we were like, this is way bigger than a magazine. So we've decided to be a media company and explore new forms of media in 2018. Awesome. And a yeah. big part of that, too, is 
Uh, I went to a book talk with Eddie Huang about six months before Slanted became something. And he said that if spaces don't exist for you, kick the door down and create them. Um, and at that time, we didn't even know this was going to be a thing. Um, and when Kat reached out to me, it just felt like the right opportunity because we didn't see ourselves in media or in mainstream media. We wanted a place where we could share our stories from everyday people. So one of the big things about Slanted is that it's not celebrities who write for us. You know, it's not published writers per se. It's people like you, me, your brother, your sister, your cousin, who just have a story to tell. And they just want a place to share that and to connect with other people. So Slanted's really supposed to be a community building creative outlet for all of us. Um, all of us were friends when we started this. So I think that's what makes it extremely special. Definitely. And so, I mean, touching on that point of the idea of like building a community, I mean, I feel like one thing we talk about with the Asian Googler Network a lot is that there is very little consensus on what it means to be Asian American. Um, you know, that term encompasses, in theory, like hundreds of different like ethnicities and languages. There's also the question of, you know, citizens and non-citizen residents of the U.S. who, you know, are impacted by issues that affect the community, but, you know, may not have been here as long or may not be here forever. How do you guys sort of define that idea of Ameri Asian American identity for the purposes of the magazine? So for the magazine, we define Asian American as anyone who has come from Asia, so including East Asian, Southeast Asian, and South Asian. And there are a lot of different groups, and our goal is not to sort of lump everyone into one category. It's more to celebrate the differences that we all have and the shared experiences that we do have. I think one thing that the Asian American movement is getting better at is being in solidarity with each other. Because in the past, we've been very separated. Just thinking about our history in America, coming to America, no ethnic group wanted to associate themselves with another ethnic group that had already come because they wanted to not face those same, the same discrimination. But now, like I feel since the 90s and coming into the 2000s, we're really starting to come together. And we're realizing that together we are stronger and we can make a difference as a, as a one whole collective. Yeah, and being this like hyphenated culture has been an interesting thing for us at Slanted because uh, when we edit a lot of the pieces from issue one, a very common theme was straddling two worlds. So straddling what it's like to be Asian, what it's like to be American, not fitting in either place. Um, and that's something that I think we wrestle with individually and collectively as a community. So when we look for contributors, we're looking for people who are exploring this question of what it means to be Asian American. Um, it's not a 50-50 split. It's just an ongoing journey. And everyone on this team is also going through a sense of self-discovery in the process. So when you were crafting this first issue of the magazine, how did you go about sourcing different voices and different parts of the Asian American community? So it was a pretty grassroots effort. We had a Google form that we just sent nice. out to friends and family. <laughs> Great way of collecting information. <laughs> um, and from there, we made sure that every piece had a mission, that the author had something that they wanted to say to the community. And the theme of our first issue was beginnings. So whether that's a spiritual beginning or self-awakening or the start of something new, we wanted to make sure that every piece related to the theme. Mm -hmm. And we purposely tried to keep it very open. Um, you know, it's very interpretive for each person. And we looked to get people from all over the country. So although we're in New York City right now with, you know, on this event, our contributors come from all across the country. Uh, we had 21 for this first issue, and we actually only knew seven of them beforehand. Um, we don't know how they found us. I think it was through word of mouth, but that speaks to the solidarity of our community, just looking for a place to share their stories. Hmm. Interesting. Um, Tessa, I know we were talking earlier about, you know, balancing the fact that you guys have put so much work into launching this while also having these amazing careers in tech and in marketing and all of these other things. So I'd like to hear from all of you, I guess, about, you know, what it's been like balancing a passion project and starting a new media company with having these full-time other jobs. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot. Um, <laughs> like, the journal was going through a reorg at the time that things were really ramping up, and, like, I was planning my wedding, and we were launching this, and it was, like, there were times where I was, like, very stressed out, but I think that this is a situation in which the phrase passion project is really very applicable because, like, some of my friends and I have, like, started projects where we were really into them, but, like, they never really went anywhere because... You know, like if things came up, it kind of took a back seat. But this is like 
the kind of project where, for me, it meant something very personal. So I was able to kind of prioritize it over certain other things because it meant so much to me and it meant so much to everyone else who was doing it. Um, I was actually talking to Gary about this this morning. Um, I feel very lucky that I hit my quarter life breakthrough uh, <laughs> shortly before starting Slanted, where up until then, I kept thinking my job had to be my calling, had to be my passion, had to be my everything. Um, and then I realized that it didn't have to be that. It didn't have to put so much pressure on my job being something bigger than what it really was. Um, and so I happened to land a job, a nine to five, that truly was essentially a nine to five. Um, and I love what I do. I love doing branding. And the company is really supportive of me doing side projects like this. And so the epiphany of having a job that supports me in the way that allows me to do something like Slanted or pursue a passion project is really pivotal. Uh, we joke that Slanted is like a second job. Um, and I definitely would not have been able to do it if it wasn't for the support of my current company. That was a good pivot there, because I was like, uh-oh, she's going, oh, yeah, it's not really a passion of mine, 9 to 5. It is. <laughs> like, I see this. But, it definitely you know. is. It's a 5 to 9, for sure. Yeah. But it's like a very a very loving piece of like my 5 to 9. Right. I can't imagine any other team to do this with either. I right. think the passion that we all have, the personal drive, is a really big factor. So what kinds of things have you done to sort of raise awareness of the magazine and go out and spread the word that there is this new voice in the landscape? I think right now, most of it has been word of mouth, which just is a testament to how strong the community is. Um, our biggest channel right now is Instagram. I think us being millennials, it was a natural outlet for us to speak directly to our audience. But in the new year, in 2018, we're going to be looking at events, hopefully across the country, um, more marketing on social media channels, and paid advertising as well. And also just co-creation or collaborative events. Um, or even initiatives. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've been very active about going to other events, meeting people, not just Asian Americans, but other communities of color, uh, to see what types of events they're interested in, what kind of dialogue they want to be a part of, and how we can really raise awareness in that way. Because something we discovered at the launch party was that this isn't just for Asian Americans. Like We are a platform specifically to elevate the Asian American narrative, but it's a broader immigrant story. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, I think we have the power to really make a stronger impact by collaborating with others. So has your idea of like what representation looks like changed as, as you formed the magazine? Or what, what do you see yourselves highlighting or, or really elevating thematically in the future? I think so. So one thing that was an interesting shift is when we first started Slanted, we thought we would create a community to bring like-minded people together. And then after the election happened and seeing the divisiveness within our country, we realized that we don't need to bring similar people together. We need to bring different people together mm -hmm. and people with different experiences, cultural backgrounds and perspectives and show that even though you are different, you can still be friends. And in the end, we all share the same fundamental stories of being a human. I think it's also kind of like a cultural movement that's happening that we are just a part of. Um, I think that you can see that in like Hollywood with people speaking out against like the whitewashing of Asian roles in traditionally um, Asian movies or like the Hawaii Five O cast like walking when they weren't paid equally. Um, just all s sorts of things like that are really coming to the surface now. And I think that's what makes our platform especially relevant and especially like needed. Yeah, has that been like a big reaction from people? Is that specifically they talk about Hollywood whitewashing or representation in media when they talk to you guys about what they want to see? We do get a lot of questions, like anytime we talk to press about things going on gotcha. in the media. Um, but it's interesting because we, it's not just about that. Like the story is so much larger, and we're just one piece of the puzzle that needs to happen in order to push the movement forward. I think also because we're rooted in personal storytelling. So the questions that we get or the topics that we get fished for um, are a little bit deeper than that. I mean, they definitely cover representation in media or lawsuits, per se. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that really struck home for us was um, a lot of reaching out from uh, families who adopt Asian kids into their mm -hmm. families. Oh. Interesting. And that's a story that, personally, I haven't explored yet. Um, I would love to explore in future issues. But just these open questions about what do we do? How do we talk about race and identity with our kids who grew up looking different than us? Um, and so it's a very sensitive 
piece to talk about, um, but I think that's something that we can do. We can create a safe space for that conversation to happen. That's really interesting that that's kind of the audience that's surfaced for you guys. Do you have, do you feel like you have a response for that or is there kind of a sense of like, well, we can't define for you what your child's like Asian identity is? Right, obviously that's a very big role to fill, but I do think these everyday stories can help. Like I'm thinking of when I was growing up, did I have a magazine that I could pick up and read about other Asian American experiences? Um, I didn't really have anything like that. So this could be, Slanted could be something for that lone kid in Arkansas who might not have a community that looks like him or goes through the same experiences that he does for him to pick it up and say, wow, there are other people that can relate to what's happening to my experience. Mm -hmm. As well as act as a resource. So like we're definitely not the authority on anything like the Asian American narrative per se, but um, every time we talk to someone, they get so excited and want to connect us with five more people in the community. So mm -hmm. maybe we can't speak about that story in particular, but maybe we can connect them with someone um, who can put them in touch with someone else or share their own story. Definitely. So in that sense, what has been your vision of like, I know you were saying you actually decided to become a more full rounded media company rather than a magazine. Is that where the idea comes from is creating resources? Um, not necessarily just for resources. I think it's to expand the reach and realizing that stories come in many different shapes and sizes and forms. Mm -hmm. um, we've gotten so much clamor about digital. Um, <laughs> I am a diehard paper fan, but I do <laughs> recognize that in the 21st century, digital is really critical. They can both work together. They can work together. <laughs> um, so figuring out how we can create more platforms for storytelling because we were created to fill a need. Mm. And we can't just fill that need with paper or with print. Right. Also the fact that we want to create a community that has a two-way dialogue. Mm -hmm. So whereas putting out a magazine and having someone consume it is more of a one-way conversation, we really want to create spaces where people can interact with the content and interact with each other um, and start to talk about these issues that are so complicated and nuanced that really need discussion around it in order to move things forward. Yeah, I think that especially today, like if we are trying to reach that lone kid in Arkansas who like doesn't have a any Asian friends or like an Asian, Asian community, like an online presence that's robust and really a community in itself is so important. Right. So it sounds like you guys do an amazing job of, of kind of giving a voice to people like that who don't feel they have a community currently. But on the flip side, like I was talking to a friend recently who mentioned that he really thinks of himself more as Asian rather than Asian American and that you know if he wanted to see himself represented in the media he could watch Chinese movies and read Chinese books um, and do you see like a divide there between the experiences of more recent Asian immigrants or maybe even non like non permanent residents who you know who are in the states for now um, versus like sort of American born or American raised um, Asian Americans mm, Asians <laughs> I think there's actually, from my experience, there's been quite quite a difference where uh, I went going to a school like Duke University, there are a lot of international students and of course some from China, some from Korea, some from the Middle East, but I think the very nature of being international and not you know, coming into a country and having to find people that are like you, they sort of group themselves off very quickly and they, they form their own communities. And so whereas for me, like being Asian American growing up, um, growing up in pr predominantly white communities, uh, I was much more, not to say that they're not open to that, but I was already sort of in those groups and in those communities, whereas there is th definitely that divide between the two. And I think for me as an Asian American, it's almost difficult to, to connect with other Asians from actually from Asia or born <laughs> in Asia. Yeah. yeah, I think to that point, an interesting, like not a trend, but a pattern that's emerged, I think, in our conversations and in the stories that we hear is that like, you have this unique position where you're kind of like too Asian to be American, but you're like too American to really be Asian to actual Asian or to people who live in Asia. So being Asian American is this really interesting place to be. And like for me personally, when I was younger, I like didn't want to have anything to do with it. So I would like ignore all my Chinese homework and I like hated my Chinese lessons and now I don't know how to speak Mandarin, <laughs> which I really regret. So if I were looking for more Asian representation in media, like I wouldn't be able to watch Chinese movies or like read Chinese books. I would just I'm looking for Asian representation like in American media. So I think it's a really unique thing to you and like how deep your connection is to your Asian heritage. 
I think part of the divide, the, some of the cause potentially, could be we, we gravitate towards people who give us a sense of belonging. And so um, as Asian Americans, maybe we gravitate more towards Asian Americans because we get the traditions that they're observing or the food that they're eating. Um, and people coming from another country, potentially, they can't speak the language, and they feel a sense of belonging within a specific group. And so it almost feels like a sense of survival tactic in, this, in a way. Um, I would love to break down that divide. We've talked about the hierarchies within Asian American culture. Um, that's something we definitely want to explore because, again, Asian American isn't just East Asian. And so what does that hierarchy look like and how we can start to break that down and to really connect on a more human level beyond race? Yeah, and I think that would be the ultimate goal is to break down that barrier between Asian Americans and Asians because if we're all living in America, then we can all benefit from having a more solid community. Do you see any value then in doing like multilingual content or you know having people from lots all these different ethnic and language groups who are contributing doing stuff that's maybe like translated in both languages or anything like that? That, that would, would be, be really amazing. Cool. <laughs> Once we have the resources, yes. Yeah, to Tessa's point, like I personally can't read Mandarin or read Chinese. Yeah. I would love to be able to. Another regret, also, uh, going to ten years of Chinese school and not studying hard. Um, I would love to be able to translate that because we've gotten actually inquiries from folks who don't live in the U.S. Oh, interesting. Um, so we were trying to figure out as a startup, like how do we ship to another country? Um, how do we translate things in another language? But that would be amazing if we could do that. I think to, to that question, I don't know if any of you guys saw the most recent show at the Guggenheim. So it's an exhibition on Chinese art. Um, and I think as someone who appreciates art and has studied art in school, I was really surprised to find how different it was to look at art that was, you know, we, we see a lot of text art, but text art that was Chinese based and based off of Chinese characters. And that gave me a really new, a, a newfound appreciation for what art could be. And, uh, if we did have stories in different texts, obviously different languages have different nuances to, to the actual uh, word. Uh, like there are a lot of words we can't express uh, in Chinese that we do express in English and vice versa. And so if there are ways to actually integrate that, that'd be great. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. I mean, I definitely see the challenge. I also don't speak any Chinese. Yeah, like as the, as the editors, it's like, yeah. how would we edit this in a different language? Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very big deal in my family that I took Japanese in college instead, so. <laughs> You're a baddie. That's, what we, that's our right. we have, yeah. Don't you have a hashtag for we that? Do. Yeah, yeah, you hashtag do. Bad Asians. <laughs> hashtag bad Asians. Um, Gary, kind of like speaking to you know, your art experience and stuff, like how did you actually like first come to get involved with Slanted and like how did you choose that piece as like what you wanted to contribute for this first issue? Yeah, so, so my sister, Lena, she, she's actually involved with the founding of Slanted. Uh, I think she was the partnership director. She's our hustler in chief. Okay. She <laughs> handled yeah. a lot of the partnerships that we had. Yeah, and so she, I guess when they were looking for contributors, uh, naturally she just reached out to me um, and I signed on. That's, that's the story for that. <laughs> but uh, in terms of the actual piece, uh, initially I was gonna write about being a minority in the contemporary art world where there are honestly aren't that many, especially in scenes like New York and London. It's hard to find Asians who are you know, at the top of the gallery chain or at the top of being good collectors. Uh, so that's what I thought about, but I mean, Tess, uh, sorry, Kat, Kat and Chrissy can really attest to this where I really struggled with that topic and I spent yeah. two months writing it, sending back drafts and missing deadlines here and there. <laughs> uh, and eventually I wanted to write something a little more personal. And th this piece was sort of, had always been in the back of my mind of accepting that I had a mental il illness. And I think writing it down really uh, was that way of you know, expressing, you know, this is who I am, so be it. I'll, I wanna share that story and uh, really try to just share it with other people who might connect to it. And I thought that was an amazing shift because it was actually a completely different piece than what we were first working on. And mental illness is something that really isn't spoken about in Asian communities. So we have a couple pieces on depression and overcoming mental illness um, in a very traditional household mm, in issue okay. one. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, it's just not, it's not considered acceptable in a lot mm -hmm. of ways, yeah. So have you had any specific reaction from readers about those pieces in particular? 
Uh, about the mental health stuff, uh, definitely a few folks. Um, one of my old roommates actually is she. She's very open about mental health, and she's actually thinking about going in uh, becoming a psychotherapist. Um, and she read that piece and was really happy that she saw that piece, like mm. saw Gary's piece, because she was excited about the prospect of people coming to terms with that and being able to openly share that maybe they're not done overcoming it yet mm -hmm. and that they're starting to seek help um, and just seek a community to have that conversation with was really interesting. Um, but there are other themes within the first issue that really resonated with folks too. Um, there's one in particular about um, an Indian American woman who renounced her Indian citizenship to take on US citizenship. Oh, interesting. And she talks about that struggle all her life growing up, wanting to be American, wanting to go to prom, and you know, driving a Range Rover with her friends, going to the mall. And then finally, <laughs> when it comes down to it and she has to renounce her Indian citizenship, uh, she feels this overwhelming sense of sadness that mm. she has to let go of a part of a culture, a part of herself that for a long time she was pushing aside. Um, and it doesn't matter what race you are, like being able to let go of something from the past to hold on to something in the future is really interesting. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I already want to read this because like <laughs> that's something my family actually went through. My mom was originally Malaysian and after my sister was born, she was like, oh, I guess I'm staying. So. <laughs> uh, but had to renounce citizenship for that. <laughs> um, so in terms of, you know, the more beyond like community building, I feel like, you know, it's almost like a political act to to create an Asian American magazine because there has been so little media attention around like the Asian American community. Um, do you guys see yourself as like a political force in some way? That's an interesting question because when we first founded it, I would say no, but now I would say it's inevitable. And I personally, and I know a lot of the people on the slanted team has been really aware of just the words that we use, making sure that everything we say is politically correct, being educated and reading up as much as we can on Asian American history and mm. what our people have been through. Um, it's just inevitably tied to the political sphere. And so I think all of us are on that journey to becoming more politically aware and present. Yeah, and everything is political these days. So yeah. <laughs> whether or not, as much as you say something or don't say something, it's political. Um, and I think, you know, our name is really bold, and I think mm -hmm. that's important to recognize because we're going to be unapologetically bold about these stories. And I think in year two, we're really looking to do that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You know, finding stories that really push the conversation uh, to be a platform for Asian Americans, not just about Asian Americans. Uh, so yeah, I would say that we could be a political force, but we need the community <laughs> behind us to do that. Right. Do you find the community sort of divided? I mean, I think my impression of the Asian American community is like that we have so many different issues. Like, you know, for instance, you know, South Asian members of the community face very different issues in terms of like racial profiling and stuff than East Asian. Has it been hard to to create like a unifying force or a unifying voice in that sense? I think that's something that we're going to be working on for years and years to come. Like we're still not there. And it's about both celebrating all these differences and the different maybe stereotypes that each group might face, um, the different experiences that we all might go through and saying that even though we have all these different experiences, we can still relate to each other. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you mentioned the, the choice of the name for the magazine. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny because we didn't think it was so controversial until we actually pushed it out there <laughs> and we get comments about it all the time. Um, but there's, there's a couple different meanings behind it. One that I love to talk about is we really want to shift people's perspectives. So putting a slant on something or putting a tilt on something and getting people to see things in a new light is really what the name Slanted is about. And the fact that it's unapologetically bold and we want to spark those conversations, our name is definitely a conversation starter and something that leads to deeper conversations. Um, another thing you had touched on earlier is like the nuance and the diversity of the Asian American community. So the term Slanted is often used as a blanket term mm -hmm. uh, to characterize all Asian Americans. Uh, but that's not fair because the origins actually come from East Asian features. Um, so what we wanted to do was reclaim this term and to actually make it a term that we can celebrate. Um, and so that's a little bit about what we are about, which is celebrating Asian American diversity and identity. So we wanted a name to characterize that. And when we first started, actually half the team was not on board with this name. <laughs> um, there, we had funny names. We had a lot of cutesy names. Mm -hmm. A lot like of food-related food Food-related ones. <laughs> um, and now I don't even think twice about it. Now I, I love that term so much, I don't even think about the derogatory nature of it, and I think that speaks a lot to what we're trying to accomplish. 
Did you follow at all that there was a lawsuit related to this name? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Does anyone want to explain more context on that? Um, <laughs> essentially, there was like this Asian American rock band called The Slants, and they were trying to trademark their name, and um, the Patent and Trademark Office wouldn't allow it because they said it was discriminatory, discriminatory towards Asians, and they were like, "But we're Asian, <laughs> and we want it." So, like, isn't this a freedom of speech situation? And eventually, and it weirdly happened to be at the same time of launch, the Supreme Court ruled in their favor, in the favor of the slants, so that they could have that name trademarked and take back ownership the way that we are. But it was so funny, because everyone was like, have you heard? Is this from the same thing? And we're like, no, it's like purely coincidental. But I think, you know, it kind of, it just even, it provides even more support for it because it's it's just like the universe is you yeah, know, the universe. working in that favor. <laughs> and actually, it was funny because we want to say that we're friends with them now because we support each other. We talked about them on our Instagram. They gave us a shout out as well. I think it's, yeah. again, speaking to the power of the community that when you find something or people who understand what, what you're going through or they just get it, um, there's like an unspoken relationship there that I think keeps blossoming. Right. No, it's interesting. I remember thinking the case itself was really interesting as well because, you know, there was this freedom of speech idea of like, well, are you allowed to reclaim this term? But I did see someone bring up alternatively that because the Supreme Court decided in favor of that band that also the Washington Redskins mm -hmm. get to keep their name as well. Yeah. <laughs> kind of a double edge. Yeah. Story. And it was interesting because I was like re-watching this Trevor Noah segment on it last night where the patent office basically told the slants, like, if you weren't Asian, you would be able to trademark this name, but because you're Asian, it gives the con like the discriminatory context. <laughs> and the guy who was like hosting the segment was basically like, so in saying that like this is a like they're trying to protect you from racial discrimination, they discriminated against you <laughs> racially. Right. How does that make sense? Yeah. The world's a crazy place. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Very complicated. <laughs> so funny. Um, so what about, um, you know, kind of transitioning from the Redskins away from <laughs> horrible, un-PC things to, like, how do you guys feel you've been trying to reach across the aisle to maybe other minority groups and stuff as well? So I think that's where our partnerships, partnerships come in. We've been going to a lot of events and meeting other people of color in the space and figuring out what we can do next year to create more community spaces that are inclusive of all races. Yeah, uh, specifically, I was telling the team over the weekend about uh, a people of color and solidarity storytelling event that I had been to in Brooklyn, of course, Brooklyn, <laughs> um, two weeks ago. And it was interesting to have a conversation of what people of color really means. Uh, traditionally, at least personally, I never felt like I fit into that category of a person of color. And it was actually hosted by folks who have Latin American uh, roots. Mm. And they had a very interesting take on this, too. They were quiet for a lot of the session, a lot of the storytelling session. And one of them came forward and said, I'm sorry I'm so quiet. Um, it's because for the first time I'm realizing that I wasn't including Asian Americans in this conversation. Hmm. I wasn't including them in this conversation of what people of color really means. Um, and I really appreciated that honesty and that vulnerability. And that's something that we believe in, too. And I think it's good for us to keep ourselves accountable and honest. And when we say Asian American, what does that mean? And when we say immigrant story, what does that mean? Um, I think it's going to be a constant learning opportunity for us and a great way for us to stay honest with ourselves. Do you see that separation of the Asian American community from other people of color as like imposed on us by other groups or something we impose on ourselves? Um, I imagine it's both. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of stereotypes about Asian Americans, right? That we're quiet, that we don't like to speak up for things. We stay in the foreground or the background. Mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing every day that that's changing. I mean, and again, there's a piece in our issue one that talks about the political uprising of Asian Americans, where a lot of times folks in the government ignore us as a voting group. They don't think that we like to vote, um, that we have a voice, and so they oversee us or they they neglect us. Um, you know, so some of it may be true a little bit, where we're not maybe speaking up as much as we would like. But I think that's changing, and I think given the election and this fire that we've all been lit underneath us to do something right. is really changing that course. Tell us a little bit about like. You know, you chose this theme of like beginnings for the first issue. I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, what that means to you and also what you kind of see as being the next theme going forward. Mm. So beginnings was a natural theme for us because it was issue one. So this was sort of the beginning of 
what Slanted was, but I think for a lot of the team, it, Slanted was a creative outlet for us to explore our own identities. I know for me personally, I grew up in a predominantly white community, and I didn't start thinking about my Asian American identity until after college, which is crazy because all of my formative years have already passed. So for me, Slanted has been a personal awakening of discovering who I am and my cultural heritage. And I think a lot of the team was along the same vein. They were discovering something about themselves too. Yeah, I mean, beginnings for me was interesting too because I grew up in the opposite situation where my neighborhood was predominantly Asian. My high school was 64% Asian growing up. <laughs> so I never felt like a minority. I went to Berkeley, which was also full of Asians. Um, it wasn't actually until I moved to New York about three years ago uh, that I felt like an other or I felt like a minority, which to, I guess, non-New Yorker seems kind of crazy because it's <laughs> yeah. such a diverse place. Um, but, you know, the conversations I was having with friends, a lot of whom are in the audience today, um, talking about our different experiences really made me realize that all of our beginnings are so different, um, but we share a lot of values, and I really wanted to explore that um, with this project. Yeah, I think also the theme, as you'll, like, read the, the pieces and the issue, a beginning means something different to everyone. So it's not even it's not even necessarily like the beginning of you like welcoming your heritage or realizing that you know you do fit in or you don't fit in. It's like beginning to form a tight relationship with your mother or like the beginning of when you first immigrated to America. It means something different for everyone and I think to be able to explore that was really cool to see how everyone interpreted it. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had any negative feedback from people? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, as you said, like whether we intend for it or not, everything is political. Yeah. So we've gotten negative feedback about our name, mm -hmm. um, pushing the envelope. Um, but you know, even it's not as much negative as it is constructive criticism. So we are very open to feedback, and we definitely ask people that we talk to as mentors, as advisors, as friends to tell us how we can up our game. Um, and so, with the content perspective, people really liked how relatable it was. But they were like, well, given how bold your name is, could you push the content a little bit further? Um, are there any other topics that you could explore? Mm -hmm. And I think that's great, because we're so new and we're so open to evolution. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, we've only been around for less than a year. So I can only imagine what's going to happen in years two to five. Yeah, and that's, that's another thing that I would love for Slanted to work on is the fact that we do get constructive criticism shouldn't stop anyone from talking about race. Like, it is very scary to talk about race. You always need to be politically correct. You know, you need to be educated about what's going on, which oftentimes prevents people from being open about talking about it. But if we don't talk about it, we're not gonna get anywhere. So we really need to make it more accessible for people to talk about these really difficult things and just be confident in where they are in their own journeys. Definitely. Um, let's take a question from over there. Thank you guys so much for coming. It's truly inspiring. I will 100% be purchasing my first <laughs> issue. I was just thinking this is the perfect gift for my little sister. Oh, um, hey. She's also half Asian, so like similar to me. Um, <laughs> no, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, my question is kind of about the, write, the story gathering piece and how you guys actually get um, stories. Do you guys, you know, just wait for them to come in? Do you guys put certain posts out and you know, on top of that, how does it, um, choosing the stories to go with a certain th theme, what is that process like? Do you want me to start? Sure. Um, so, you know, like Kat said, we love Google. We literally live and die off of Google. So <laughs> we use a Google form to collect story ideas. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the stories actually didn't end up the way they started, which we think is a really beautiful process. And we want to do more of that next year, actually workshopping the stories with people. Um, but we ask for an idea. We ask again for their objective, what they want to achieve with it, what's the key message. Um, and to get the word out, it was friends, family, and fools, um, <laughs> and posting it in community groups on Facebook. So, you know, going into Asian American interest groups, posting on their, you know, project boat, which we initially started as a support group, mm. alumni networks, basically anyone that we thought would might be interested. Mm. Um, the first two weeks were very slow. We were really worried that we weren't <laughs> going to get anyone to contribute. Um, and I don't know, something just happened. I think word of mouth, you know, it's a very grassroots movement. Right. And again, like out of the 21 contributors, we only knew seven of them uh, beforehand. Wow. So it's, we're hoping that next year is probably a little bit um, more strategic in that sense. Hopefully our name is a little bit out there and we can come out to events like these and meet more people who'd be interested in sharing their stories. 
Definitely, thank you. How should people reach you if they see this talk, for example, on our YouTube channel and they want to be a part of it? Yeah, so you can visit our website at slanted.media and we're opening the submission window for issue two in January. So you can either sign up to our newsletter to get an update or just find us on social media. We'll be very loud when the window opens so you know to come and submit your story. Is it all um, like sort of personal essay pieces or are there like poems, journalistic pieces, anything like that? It's yeah. a variety. So we have short stories. Just kidding, we don't have short stories. We have short pieces. <laughs> we have poetry, photography, art. Um, it's, it spans all genres. Anything that could be printed. Awesome. <laughs> um, what about over here? Um, I just want to say thank you again for um, sharing your piece, Gary. Like I was very touched by it. Um, I'm a Chinese psychologist, so I feel very strongly about uh, raising awareness for Asian Americans. So I was wondering if you guys have any like plans or needing contributors or like you know um, ways to kind of bring the awareness to the general community because I you know I think we all know that um, Asian Americans tend to um, solve problems in their own house and like I think um, needing to reach to them is still like there's still a huge gap. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're exploring that, but again, we're a creative platform, so how could we explore the difficult topics of mental health from a creative perspective? So could we host writing workshops or you know, town hall discussions about this? I think uh, we can't do it alone, and we're definitely not experts in this field, so we would love to partner with people who have experience in the mental health space to help us create some, a place that's safe, um, you know, that's relevant and meaningful for these people. Yeah, I, I feel like being, being so involved with the arts, I've realized there's a lot of artists and a lot of creative types that have mental illness. And I, I don't know if they go hand in hand, but uh, when I first posted my story on Instagram, I, I was really surprised by the outpour, uh, outpouring of support uh, and interest in these sorts of stories. And uh, a lot of direct messages just saying, hey, this is, you know, thank you for sharing this. Uh, I've dealt with depression myself. My sister's dealt with depression, whatever it may be. They all had their own stories. and. Again, I think this is a great platform to, to actually get the word out. And uh, with peripheral uh, topics like mental illness, this is, again, a good grounding and foundation for, for those discussions. I have a couple questions about uh, contributing. The first one is, uh, I just visited an Asian American lit class uh, at a high school yesterday. And they were all really engaging writers. So I want to know if there's an age limit to being a contributor. We have not put an age limit. Um, it's something we could consider, but right now anybody is open to, con to submitting. And then so along with that, does that mean that you have to identify as Asian American to contribute? That might be an obvious question, oh. but maybe not. So all of our issue one contributors were Asian American, but we would be open to all any race contributing as long as it aligns with our mission and aligns with the theme of issue two. Yeah, I think it depends on what the narrative yeah. is. Yeah. Mm. And I think too, you know, you bring up a good point about talking to potentially a younger audience. Um, the team struggled too with trying to figure out who is our target audience. You know, Asian American is so big. Um, so millennials were obviously an easy target because we're all millennials, but there are so many interesting stories coming out um, from high schoolers and even younger. And so how could we go into universities and high schools to have this kind of conversation? Mm -hmm. So we would be really interested in meeting people in the younger demographic to see what issues they're dealing with and how could we give them a space to share that. Hi, thanks for being here and uh, good luck on, your, on all the, the work you're going to be doing. Um, so the, the topic about translating submissions uh, reminded me a story of my grandfather started an academic journal in Korea about, I guess, nearly 50 years ago now. And when he started it, he specifically wanted um, people to submit articles written in English so that people outside of Korea, academics outside of Korea, could read it and understand what's going on. Um, so I guess um, it just brought one thing is that there's so, so many different Asian, uh, I guess, American um, languages that English is just happens to be a uniform, something that is in common. So um, I guess sometimes things get lost in translation. Maybe the, if the submission is written in the language they're most comfortable with, um, and but uh, that might be ideal. But I hope, I guess, for maybe the majority of people, it'd be I guess just English. Um, just and um, the second question: uh, Do you guys do anything with like? like the museums, like Museum of Chinese American and things like that in, in the city? 
Yeah, we actually had our launch party at the Museum of Chinese America and we're stocked there as well. And we're definitely looking to partner with other museums and other Asian American organizations. Yeah, and what, um, Kim, what was your first question? Oh, uh, it wasn't more of a question. Oh, just a comment? Sharing about, yeah, just uh, how, yeah. About, I guess similarly my grandfather also started, it's, I guess something like a zine back in the day also <laughs> yeah. uh, for political science articles. It's, it's, it's called a Korea Observer. Korea uh, Observer. And it's like, you know, all in, articles in English so that right. his, because he wanted the audience to be broader than just, mm -hmm. you know, people in Korea, just, you know, so everybody. Yeah, I think, I think that um, topic of translation is really interesting and, like, obviously something that we're excited about exploring, but we don't want to, we want to be able to do it right. We, you know, we want to be able to do the pieces justice because if it is lost in translation, then, like, right. that's, what's the point what's in, the point? in doing it? Cool. Good luck with everything. Thank, Thank you. you. Awesome. Um, I think we didn't actually touch on, like, Thoughts for the next issue? Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, um, funny you ask, because we just had our kickoff over the weekend to start thinking about issue two. Gotcha. Um, we haven't narrowed down a theme yet, but our creative team did a really great job in the prompt. So the prompt was wishes and wonders. Um, so thinking about reflecting on this past year, or almost a year, what do we wish we had covered? Um, what are we wondering about still today about race and identity? And there were a whole swath of different options. We had stuff that was very universal to like what they call like the dark horse theme. Very which is niche. Very niche, <laughs> uh, very, very specific, a little bit controversial. Mm. Um, I think, huh? Earwax. Earwax. <laughs> what? Yes. Um, <laughs> so it's a wide range, and I think we're going to land somewhere in the middle. I think, um, you know, we want a theme that's universal enough that people can interpret on their own and make it their own, um, but we also want something that's not generic. And I think two things that we're looking for in this next round is, as Christy mentioned, pushing the envelope a little bit. So because these are everyday stories, how can we elevate them and make sure that they're worth the buzz and worth sparking those larger conversations? And another thing is making things a bit lighter. So issue one was leaned on the more heavier side, which is normal because the experiences that we've had that we face as Asian Americans are on the heavier side but how can we bring a sense of fun and playfulness back into talking about these really heavy topics will be interesting for us to explore yeah definitely um, we're almost at time so my last question is going to be you know we obviously want to sell some of those magazines in the back you guys so, um, how would you pitch the magazine to a non-Asian audience oh that's a great question <laughs> I mean, I feel like part of the appeal is that it's, I don't know, like, <laughs> I'm not explaining myself right, but I think that, like, so my in-laws are not Asian, but they were just so excited that I was doing something like this with my friends that they were, like, telling all their friends mm -hmm. and, like, they were buying all these books. And I think that just the fact that it's part of a movement that has pieces that like everyone can relate to. I think everyone can relate to at some point feeling like they don't belong somewhere or wishing that they were different or connecting to their heritage. I think that everyone has some sort of connection with what we're doing, which in a way like helps sell itself. Mm -hmm. I think it's anchored in human emotion. Um, you know, there's themes about sacrifice, about love, about realization, actualization. Like, these are themes that transcend race. Um, so I would say it's just a fun, creative outlet for people to read stories and learn something about themselves or learn something about another culture. Um, and who doesn't want to do that in this day and age, given what's going on? <laughs> Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>